Today, we're going to take a little bit of a dive into the foundations of a Billy Napier offense we'll see at Florida. We'll preview tonight's game between Florida and Georgia in men's basketball, and we'll wrap up by talking about Arliss Boardingham, who decides tonight between Oregon and Florida, only here on Locked On Gators. You are Locked On Gators, your daily podcast on the Florida Gators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Locked On Gators, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On Gators your first listen of the day. We are available daily and free wherever you listen to the podcast. Happy Wednesday. I am Brandon Olson. You can find me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. Find all my written work with Whole Nine Sports. That is W-H-O-L-E. And I any sports. We're going to get right into this. I'm very excited. You guys know that I like talking. I like talking scheme. I, li- I like talking all this stuff. So today we're going to talk about just, just two foundations of a Billy Napier run offense where we're not going to go super in depth on things. You know, like we could talk about the wide zone, but we're not going to do that today. We're talking about the two biggest things when you, when I think of a Billy Napier offense, which is one 12 personnel two motion. So 12 personnel, if you don't know, is one running back, two tight ends, two wide receivers, which in this case will likely be whichever one of the stable of running backs will play. Tight ends, we'll talk about who might be out there. And receivers, Xavier Henderson, Justin Shorter, best blockers, number two, number one and number two guys. You know, we'll see a lot of 11 personnel with three receivers, one tight end, one running back. But 12 personnel is what we're talking about here because I love it. <laughs> I have very openly said tight end is my favorite offensive position, whether it's scouting or just scheming things up. I, I, lo- I love it. I love the tight end position because... Um, you, you can do so much of them. You can move them inside, outside. You can move them around the formation pre-snap. You can do whatever you want. So tight end is my favorite offensive position. Defenses have gotten smaller. You look at these linebackers that were playing safety in high school, linebackers in the NFL that are getting getting smaller. There used to be you know guys like Mark Barron where it's like, oh, he's too big to play safety. He's got to play linebacker. Where now he's linebacker size legitimately. And that's big when you look at an offense where – you know, if the offenses get heavier, it's a lot easier to run the ball, which is what Billy Napier wants to do. I mean, think of, for an NFL comparison, think of the Baltimore Ravens. So many NFL teams are smaller. They go nickel every single time. They've only got two linebackers, and one of their linebackers is safety size. And then you've got an offense with two or three tight ends on the field. They can run the ball at will on you. And that's what the Baltimore Ravens have been doing for a couple of years now. You look at guys like Mark Andrews, Nick Boyle, Patrick Ricard on that team that are just pummeling these lighter defenders. That's what Billy Napier wants to do with this 12 personnel. I think in year one, it might be a little rough fit with the roster of how things are going to work out. But we've got two tight ends on the field at the same time. You're looking at one guy who's going to have his hand in the dirt in a three-point stance. He's traditionally your blocking type. He's not going to be a complete burner offensively, but but he's going to be your blocker. And I'm a little upset because I thought that Kimura Gamble would have been perfect in this role. I think he would have been great hand in the dirt, let him pummel dudes, let him, let, let him get into space a little bit on offense when he's catching the ball. But for the most part, just put him put him on the field and let, let him run through dudes. Uh, that role is the best way to get someone like uh, Hayden Hansen, the three-star tight end that just came in. That That's going to be a great role for him. Jonathan Odom, going to be a great role for him too. Those, those bigger guys that can that can get their hands on defenders and, and help block. You know, you don't have to be amazing. A lot of the times when you're blocking anybody, you're going to be blocking with an offensive tackle. So it's just added security there. And, I mean, you're going to have to hold your own against – smaller linebackers and safeties and DBs in general. But for the most part, you're going to be helping an offensive tackle. The other tight end is the the fun tight end. We talk about them where they're, they're the move tight end. You know, they're, they're the Kyle Pitts types. They're, well, eh, I mean, as Kyle Pitts type as you can get, he is a unicorn. But they're the tight ends where you move them across the formation. They're the ones going in motion. They're the ones creating space, and you just want to get them the ball. I think we're going to see someone there where it's going to be Keon Zipperer is going to be big for that role. And they're usually worse blockers, but that's not to say that they can't block because part of the reason of moving them is to kind of help them just get that momentum built to block and things like that, where it's, it's going to be really fun. That's what we talk about with motion there. But I think with the current roster, we could see someone like Jonathan Odom start at tight end as that, that inline tight end is what they're usually called. The ones that are right next to the offensive tackle and the ones that are supposed to be bigger, better blockers. 
So that could be Jonathan Odom with his hand in the dirt and Keon Zipper as the move tight end. But I also think Keon Zipper is good enough as a blocker where you can see a little fun combo of him being the inline tight end, that blocking type. And then you see someone like Nick Elksness, who's more of a big slot or a move tight end, an H-back kind of guy, where you can see him in that move spot with Keon Zipperer at that inline spot. And then here's the thing, too. We're going to see a lot of tight ends play. We're going to see, you know, I mentioned, uh, I, think, I think I tweeted it yesterday, and I'm going to talk about it later with August Boardingham, where we saw Billy Napier run a lot of tight ends playing. Like They, they play a lot of tight ends in Louisiana under Billy Napier, and that's going to be no different with Florida. You know, of the top nine skill positions players, tight ends were four of them in Louisiana under Billy Napier. So we're going to see them play a lot. And then motion is the other thing that we get to talk about where that second tight end that I mentioned with Louisiana and with Florida, that's their job. They're, they're the motion tight ends. They're going to be moving a lot. They've got to create some space. They've got to get in space and block. So we're, we're going to see that happen a lot. That's your job in 12 personnel. You're going to move a lot. You're going to create confusion. And there's two major benefits to using motion. First is they usually help you read a defense. You know, it, it's not a guarantee, but if a defender follows a receiver across the formation, it can help you identify if it's man or zone, what type of zone, what type of man, what kind of combo you could see with coverage. So that's big, especially when you want to pass the ball. But that's not really Billy Napier's, um, I don't want to say expertise, but that's not Billy Napier's goal. He wants to run the ball. So how does that help you with running the ball? And it's my favorite reason. I'm, I'm a big run guy. I like the wide zone that we're going to talk about in another episode. But it kind of helps you because when you send someone in motion, you have to, you have to as a defense, identify who's going in motion. You need to communicate what assignment shifts, what assignment changes, how your alignment might change. And it can cause confusion because it is very hard to get 11 guys on the same page. And when you create motion and you create havoc, that helps, especially in the run game where you can cause just a little bit of confusion, a little bit of hesitancy. And in that front seven, that will open rushing lanes. Like I, I, I love motion. Um, that That's one of the reasons I love Billy Napier higher. He runs 12 personnel. He goes motion. He loves the wide zone. He's my kind of coach. So I love this. But uh I've always said something when you're talking about just just scheme in general. You know, you can work as hard as you want. You can't always outrun a team. You can't always overpower a team. But if you work hard enough, you can always be the team that outsmarts the opponent. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to cause confusion against this defense. We're going to make them think and make them mess up. And that's one of the reasons where teams that run the triple option have done well against schools even like Bama, who's got such a good defense, but you make them think and you make them react instead of really just, just playing football. You, you make them pause and be hesitant there. That second reason is going to be big for Florida. They will be running the ball. You can look at the Alabama game this past year where motion helped Florida score against Alabama because it helped cause a little bit of confusion on the defensive side of the ball. And like I said, like we've got more to look at. But for today, that's it. When we're talking team, we're going to get to the wide zone. Don't worry. I, I love the wide zone, so we're going to get to it. But we've got some other stuff to talk about, like the Florida-Georgia game. But first, it's the new year, and that means New Year's resolution time. And by this point, uh, a lot of people give up on their New Year's resolution. Like, yeah, no, it was, it was a New Year's resolution. Now it's the second month. It doesn't matter that much. But if you're trying to eat healthier or you're trying to just get fit, Make sure to include Built Bar in your plan. I'm horrible at keeping my, my New Year's resolution. We know that. I like sweets. I've openly said that just so many times. But with Built Bar, it's a little bit easier because it's already coated in 100% chocolate. Most bars have 130 calories and just four net carbs, along with 17 grams of protein. Throw out the hidden stashes, the Reese's in the desk drawer, the Kit Kat, the Snickers, whatever, three musketeers. I was never a fan, but you know, it is what it is. Get Bilt Bar. You don't got to sneak around. You don't got to feel bad. And they have so many flavor varieties that you, you just got to try it. You will never get bored. Use promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off of your next order. That is LOCKED. L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5 to get 15% off of your next order at Bills or BiltBar.com. Also, just a quick reminder, it's Super Bowl week. We've got the Lockdown NFL podcast, Lockdown Bengals, and Lockdown Rams all in L.A. on Radio Road to cover the game brought to you by Get Upside. Talking about this Florida Gators versus Georgia Bulldogs game tonight, uh, it, it's the 15-8 and 8 Florida Gators hosting 
the six and 17 Georgia Bulldogs. And, you know, that seems like just looking at the records, that seems like pure dominance for Florida. But Georgia's not a great team. I'm not going to say they're a great team. They're not. But they're also not a pushover squad. They're, they're not those guys. They, like Florida, are, um, what's the adjective, wildly inconsistent. But Georgia has a much lower floor and a much lower ceiling than the Florida Gators. But, I mean, Georgia just this past Saturday took Auburn to the wire and all, and only lost 74-72. And by the way, if you're if you don't follow just outside of Florida, Auburn is the number one team in the nation in men's college basketball. And Georgia took them 74-72 to the wire. And Auburn's played down to their opponents. You know, we saw the Missouri game. They won by one a couple of weeks ago. Things like that. But don't get me wrong. Like they, they you've like they beat Florida by more. So so you gotta worry about things like that. But uh what's not great for Florida in this game, I think, is that Georgia's offense pretty consistently uh, hits in the mid seventies, mid to high seventies sometimes, but they they pretty consistently hit seventy. And Florida, well, doesn't. Florida wins games, you know, sixty six fifty two and sixty six sixty two and things like that. But that's not great when you're playing a team that can consistently hit in the seventies. And granted, Georgia. They're not usually going against a defense that's as good as Florida, especially when you look at Florida with Colin Castleton. They're a damn good team here, or defensively. They're a damn good team. But uh, I'm I'm just going into this game, and I'm like, okay, hopefully Georgia's defense, because Georgia's defense is bad. They consistently score in the 70s, but they consistently give up the high 70s. I, I believe they allow 77 points per game, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so, you know, I'm hoping that Georgia's defense is bad enough for Florida to take advantage and put up points, because we've also seen, even when Florida is open, they tend to kind of shoot themselves in the foot a little bit, and that's not great when you want to win this game. But uh, I, I think that Florida has a kind of distinct advantage uh, when going against Georgia that I'm really excited for because especially over their past five or six games, Georgia has gotten killed on the interior. That, that's been a big issue for them. They're, you know, they're not great defending the three, but on the interior of the past few games, They've been beaten down, and they've gotten into quite a bit of foul trouble. So I'm looking at this game tonight, and I'm saying, well, we got to get the ball to the interior, whether it's driving the lane or whether it's attacking with Colin Castleton, whatever it may be, we got to get the ball to the interior. And then I look at Colin Castleton, and I'm like, you know, he just came back. Like, he just came back, and he's hungry. You could see it in that game on Saturday. He was hungry to come back. So you look at Colin Castleton, and it's like, well, he could eat tonight. Like, like Georgia has seriously been demolished on the interior, not rebounding-wise, but demolished on the interior scoring-wise. And they've gotten into a lot of foul trouble recently. I think it was just uh, three games ago they gave up, like, they allowed 28 free throws, if I'm not mistaken. That's, that's, that's pretty bad. You got to convert on those, though. That's a big thing for Florida. But I, I think that we could be looking at one of those games where we see Colin Castle, and he'll probably get his usual – eight rebounds or whatever it may be, but we could see a 20 to 25 point game from Colin Castle, if not a little bit more. I, I want Florida and Mike White to Joel and beat it tonight and just be like, hey, 41% or 42% of the time, it's ending with a Colin Castle shot or pass out, or whatever. His usage rate is going to be 42%. I'd, I'd love to see that from Colin Castle because, you know, he's one of the fresher guys in terms of stamina. Obviously, he's coming off a shoulder injury, so he might not be 100% there. But, I, I mean, I want to see him get it. And I mean, also, when you look at this game, it's like this game, like every Florida game, it's just a matter of who shows up. You know, Myron Jones has been coming off the bench. He's kind of improved his shooting percentage, but I feel like a lot of that is just because he's not given the opportunity to shoot as many bad shots as he loves to do. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm going to look at Tyree Appleby here because Tyree Appleby is that other catalyst of this Florida offense after – Colin Castleton, of course. So Tyree Appleby, are we getting the Tyree Appleby that can that can shoot threes? That's going to go five for six from three or four for five from three, whatever it may be. Or are we going to get the Tyree Appleby that shoots one for ten from the field and one for eight from three? So are we going to get the Tyree Appleby that that can pass the ball, that can diagnose where this defense is weak and pass the ball and get the ball to his playmakers? Or are we going to see the Tyree Appleby that that couldn't shoot the ball if it was into a hula hoop? 
Or are we going to see the Tyree Appleby that when he's playing as the primary ball handler is blindfolded and, <laughs> and just hoping for the best here? So it, it's such an inconsistent team. Actually, both of these teams are so inconsistent where this is a game where the Florida Gators – should absolutely win. I realize that I've said a lot of like ifs and hypotheticals, but this is a game where Florida should win this game. Like this is a not not awful Florida team. This is an average Florida team. And that that's the thing that, that bothers me is that this is an average Florida team and we are not an average university. So that's what's been bothering me. But I, I mean, Florida should absolutely win this game by a considerable margin, depending on even if average Florida shows up, and average Georgia shows up, this is a win. But at the same time, this is a Mike White coach team. This is a team where, I mean, not even Mike White coach team. This is a Mike White built team where there's just so many errors and so many mental mistakes where should be a win. Will it be a win? Hopefully. I, th- I think it will be, but I don't know. All I know is I'm betting on it. That's that's it. Anyone else make money this weekend? I know I did kind of. I'm not going to lie. I, I, last week, I didn't bet much because Senior Bowl week, but then I came back and I was like, yeah, I'm getting into it. BetOnline.net is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your sports action. Florida's men's basketball, you kind of screwed me a lot. Women's basketball, love you. You've been making me so much money with it. So much money. It ain't much, but you know, it, it's return on investment. BetOnline.net even covers award shows, TV shows, and reality TV and If aliens will attack the world, that's a fun thing. With real-time updated odds and props on almost anything you can imagine, it's the best way to place your bets, and it's 100% free to sign up. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up. I mean, I I, I always use my mobile device. That's how I do it. Like, I use my cell phone right here. That's that. I use my phone. I I never use my laptop for it. It's just not my style. BetOnline.net, it's where the game starts. Wrapping up today's show, we are going to talk about Arliss Boardingham, the three-star wide receiver, tight end, athlete. Um, and he is making his commitment tonight at 3.30 Pacific time. So for us, that is 6.30 Eastern time, for, or for most of us listening, that is 6.30 Eastern time. And he is deciding between Florida and Oregon. And I know I usually don't dedicate a whole segment to a recruit, but he is one of the final additions or one of the final high school additions that will be coming to the University of Florida and he was someone that we were, like, I thought would commit on February 2nd, but he did not. Um, but he is a wide receiver tight end hybrid that could play an early role in Billy Napier's offense. Because like I said, wide receiver tight end hybrid are starting outside receivers are big dudes with Justin Shorter and Xavier Henderson. And we've got two tight end sets that are going to be a plenty. Why, why can't he find the field in that move tight end role? I don't want him in line. Don't put him in line. I'll fight you if he comes up in line. But put him in that move tight end role. Let him work around the formation. And he'll be a mismatch nightmare there. He, he, he I'm not going to say he's Kyle Pitts. I'm not going to say that. But he could be a mismatch nightmare against this defense. And that's going to be big. You know, and, and Florida right now only has four tight ends on roster for spring ball. We'll have, I believe, six going into the season. But under, Louis- or under Billy Napier, Louisiana had four tight ends. Like I said before. Four of the top nine non-quarterback, non-offensive linemen that played on this on that Louisiana offense last year were tight ends. Four tight ends played over 315 snaps last season for Louisiana, whether it was in-line tight end, out wide, in the backfield, as an H-back, whatever it might have been. Four tight ends played over 100, well, played over 315 snaps last year. That is a lot of snaps for a tight end or to be committed to tight ends. It's also entirely possible that with Arliss Boardingham, if he comes to Florida, he could show up as a wide receiver. He, like he could show up. He's been commit, he's been recruited by Kiri a lot, so he could show up as a wide receiver. He could show up as a tight end, and if it doesn't work out, he can move to the other spot. That's an entire, or he could just not have an official designation where um, obviously he'll have an official designation where he'll be listed as wide receiver or tight end, but. You know, he could be listed as wide receiver and some games play more snaps at tight end. Some games play more snaps at wide receiver. He can move around. You don't have to, you don't have to pigeonhole someone into a position. I hate when people do that. So Arliss Boardingham could be someone who moves around a lot. And it's a, it, look, it's between Florida and Oregon. And when I'm looking at these two schools, I don't know how you can pick Oregon unless it's just 
I want to be closer to home because that's the biggest advantage. Uh, and I want more drip because I mean, Oregon has a billion different uniform combinations. But I think when you're looking at from a, a, a non, I want to be closer to home stance, I think you got to go Florida. Think about early playing time. That's advantage Florida. You know, tight end right now, especially tight end right now, <laughs> is wide open for the Florida Gators, especially because it's wide open with a coach that wants to run two tight end sets a lot, and we don't have one clear-cut tight end. So we are one clear-cut leading tight end. It's probably Keon Zipper. We can we can make that assumption, but maybe, maybe Billy Napier's not impressed with Zipper's blocking. Maybe he wants to play more... Uh, Jonathan Odom. Maybe as a receiver, he wants more Nick Elksis. So, I mean, we, we, when you're looking at playing time early, Arliss Boardingham, Florida is the spot to go. If you're looking at which university has put more wide receivers into the NFL over the past few years, Florida is the way to go. Florida, I, I don't know which university has, I mean, obviously Bama probably has put more receivers into the NFL. But there are not many universities that have put more wide receivers into the NFL over Florida. You know, you look at the best wide receiver to come out of Oregon over the past couple of years. He's now playing tight end for the Saints, Juwan Johnson. And he was at Penn State for most of his career, transferred to Oregon. And then he got moved to tight end when he got to the NFL. So, yeah, they're, they're doing a great job of getting wide receivers into the NFL. You look at tight ends to the NFL, do you get better than Kyle Pitts? Actually, no, you don't because... Kyle Pitts was the highest drafted tight end in NFL history. So you look you look at which university puts tight ends into the NFL. And like I said, Juwan Johnson went to the NFL as a wide receiver and got moved to tight end. So Oregon didn't develop him as a tight end. Oregon didn't develop him enough as a wide receiver, and he got moved to tight end. So And like he didn't have enough of the, the nuances of the route running and all that fun stuff. So he, he's playing tight end now. So let's see. Playing time, Florida. Wide receivers to the NFL? Florida. Tight ends to the NFL. Florida. Closer to home, Oregon. That's fine. Um, it, depending on what your favorite color is or what, what drip you like, Oregon, sure, could go Florida if you're a Jordan guy. I mean, and and you like that blue because that blue is so sweet. So it could be Florida. Um, but then you look at one of the biggest things here. It's coaching staff with a proven track record. That's advantage Florida. Because Oregon right now has first a defensive minded head coach. They're they got two co-offensive coordinators. Neither of them are wide receiver or tight end focused. Their tight ends coach was a running backs coach last year, which is the same for Florida with William Piegler, but at least William Piegler was a tight end coach before or was working with tight ends before that. And you look at this coach, it's Kiri Colbert's, you know, he he's the guy that people think of as he gets receivers to the NFL. You look at William Piegler. Everyone loves him. He was a running backs coach last year. Sure, he worked with tight ends before that. He's gotten guys to the NFL. Or Kenneth Walker, especially, he's about to go to the NFL as a running back. But, hey, he can develop talent. He can recruit talent. He can build you up, and he can he can recruit – or not recruit character, but he can help you build your character because that man is dope. So I, I think you look at his coaching staff, and it's like, well, Florida's the way to go because Florida's got an offensive coach that is going to develop you. Their offensive coordinator, who is not their offensive play caller, is the offensive line coach. And if you're working as a tight end, you're probably going to get a little bit of block and help from that offensive line, and you're going to be better suited for the NFL. So I think if you're Arliss Boardingham, you look at Florida, and I, and I I know that there have been places where you know they're they're better for this stuff than Florida. But if you look at Florida and Oregon, Florida is a clear cut choice. If I mean that's what I'm saying. So get used to maybe having Arliss Boardingham. In Gainesville, I'm excited for him. I hope he comes to Gainesville. I, I like him. I've been watching his stuff, and I'm, I'm a fan of his. So hopefully he'll be there. Thanks for making Lockdown Gators your first listen of the day. Every day we are available daily and free wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be back tomorrow to talk more Florida Gators. Make sure to check out the Lockdown Bets podcast hosted by your boy Q and Lee Sterling. Just especially with the Super Bowl coming up, you, you're going to want to maximize your return. For Lockdown Gators, I'm Brandon Olson. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. You can find all of my written work with Whole Nine Sports. That is W-H-O-L-E-N-I-N-E Sports. And I'll see you all tomorrow.